Well, it's Resurrection Sunday. And so I want to talk to us about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus. It is the central theme of Christianity. It is, it is the message that is at the core right around the world today. Over two billion Christians uh, in their time will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christianity spread like wildfire from the time that Jesus was re resurrected because 500 witnesses saw this man who had been uh, tortured and beaten and died on a cross, raised again, and they were witness or attested to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. His disciples had been completely distraught at his death. They had been broken. They, their dream of a new day, of a new kingdom had been broken. They were crushed. But once they encountered and saw the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected Savior, they were transformed. There are those who believe that the resurrection of Jesus, a, a man coming back to life, was a hoax. They believed it was a myth. They believed that it, was not, that it wasn't possible humanly and therefore his, his disciples had made it up to perpetuate the, the message of Jesus Christ. But the, the problem with that is that his disciples went on to actually be martyred for the fact that he'd been resurrected from Christ. So um, it was, does make no sense to me that they would be perpetuating a myth that would cause them to take their own lives. Over the centuries, many atheists, agnostics, have set out to disprove the resurrection. They've tried using science, archaeology, historical references, and legal principles. In the process, many have been convinced themselves of the authenticity of the resurrection of Christ and the claims of Christianity and been converted themselves. One of the most notable of these was a man called Dr. Simon Greenleaf. He was one of the principal founders of Harvard Law School in America, uh, one of the, the greatest legal minds of the century. He wasn't a believer, and he had a tendency to put down Christians in his classroom. He would pay out on them and put them down. And then one year, his Christian students challenged him to take his three volumes on the laws of legal evidence that he'd written and apply the principles of that evidence to the claims of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he took up this challenge. In the process, he concluded that the resurrection is one of the best established facts of history and became a believer. And I can tell you, person after person who's gone on the same adventure, the same episode to try and disprove Christianity, only to end up that the facts themselves are undeniable. Christianity, and, it, and it is central to Christianity, is the resurrection of Jesus. So if it's historically proven that Christ died on a cross, claimed to be the Son of God, and rose from the dead, well, what's its significance to you and to me today? The message of Good Friday, the one we celebrated a few days ago, is the, great, is the message of the greatest love that could ever be. The message that God loved you and I so much that he sent his son Jesus to become one of us, to die in our place, to be punished for our sin. That's the message of Good Friday. But the message of, Good, of Easter Sunday, the, the theme of Resurrection Sunday, if the theme of Friday is God's love, well, the theme of Sunday is God's power. And his power to change lives, his power to change history. I want to look at three things that, that authenticate or three reasons the resurrection is important to you and I, to all of those of us who are watching right now. The first thing I want to touch on this morning is this, the resurrection authenticates the claims of the cross. It authenticates. I don't know how many of you, well, I'm presuming many of you have, have an iPhone or, or an Android or something in between. And uh, so often what, what, what it used to be for a while, you'd use a pin code and then it was, then it was a, a thumbprint and now it's a, a face identification. And so I was in a store yesterday. I went in there and I, I downloaded this app for QR codes, not realizing it was the wrong one. I was, I was just talking to Danielle and I'm playing along and it said authenticate and I did my face thing and I clicked on the side and suddenly I've subscribed to $4 a month for some stupid app that I don't really need that I didn't realize it was the wrong one. 
And the reason I subscribed to it is I, my face authenticated the purchase. I just double clicked on it and it looked at me and it said, oh, you're the right person and you authenticated the purchase. I quickly went to iTunes and boy, it's hard to unauthenticate those things. Man, you've got to go like five levels deep to even get out of any subscription. It's like, oh, I've got you now for the rest of your life. For it all. Anyway, leave that alone. The resurrection authenticates the claims of the cross. What does that mean? Well, throughout history, many individuals have died for a good cause. Many individuals have laid their life down in wars defending freedom. Many individuals have, 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 there are story after story of good people dying for other people in their place and a sacrifice in their place. Good people who gave their lives willingly. And some people want to put Jesus in that category. Some people want to tell us that, well, Jesus was one of those, a good person who taught good truths and that they're pretty good things to live by. And ultimately, he was a good man who died on a cross to, to show us that God loves us. And that's, that's a nice message. But there was more going on at the cross that, we, that needed to be proved. See, Jesus wasn't just a good man. He claimed to be God. So you've got to come up with one of two places that would Jesus, if he claimed to be God, either he was a lunatic or he was God. There's no in between. His disciples followed him to their own deaths. We would call that, we would call that crazy. We would call that manipulative. We would call, call that a, a dictator. But Jesus' disciples followed him to, the, to his own death. So we have to understand that he claimed to be God, but he didn't just claim to be God. He claimed that his death was the punishment for your sin and for my sin. He claimed that, the, the Bible says it like this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When he died, it was for, for your mistakes and my mistakes. When he was crucified on that cross, he was dealing with the problem of sin. Because he's loving and merciful, Jesus went to the cross. And it's a big claim. It's a massive claim. That our sins could be forgiven through the death of a man on a cross. And so that claim, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it would be just a great claim. It would just be talk. I'm, a, I'm an avid football fan. If you've been around here for a while, you'll realize that I have uh, a number of football teams that I follow, Carlton and the Broncos, both not doing spectacularly at the moment, let's just say. My favourite time of year is before the football season starts and I can read on our websites what a great year it's going to be. I can read all the talk uh, of, oh, we've recruited so well and we've trained so hard and the boys are looking awesome on the track and this is going to be our year. Uh, I make the mistake every year of doing this. I look at only my team's website. I don't look at anybody else's website. And so I buy into the, I don't want to say lies, but I buy in to the, the spin that this is going to be our year. I'm full of faith every year. and I'm still mostly full of faith because talk's easy. Words are cheap. It needs to be backed up with action. And this is exactly what Jesus being raised from the dead was. Jesus, this is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 4. And he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. When Jesus walked out of that tomb and was resurrected like no one has ever been resurrected, it was God in heaven going, see, the cross was real. His, your sins can be forgiven. He is indeed the perfect Lamb of God. The resurre Without the resurrection, it would have just been a nice story of Jesus claiming to provide forgiveness for your sin and for my sin. But the cross authenticated the claims of the cross. That's the first thing I want us to know. The, the second thing I want us to know is this. The resurrection of Jesus destroys the power of death. I don't know if you've ever been to a Christian funeral. There's something about a Christian funeral that sets itself apart from a funeral that is not celebrating the future of eternity and someone with God. There's a, I remember my father's funeral. I remember my mother's funeral. There's a, there's a sadness because we've lost someone we love. 
There's a sadness because they're not going to be around anymore. And we will, there's a hole in our heart that's left because they're not going to be with us anymore. But, but at the same time, there's this overwhelming sense that they've gone to a better place. And one day we're going to see them again. And the reason that we have that sense of confidence and that sense of hope in the future is this, is when Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated death itself. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says this, as when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. That's what Good Friday dealt with, sin. At the cross, Jesus dealt with sin. But then it goes on, and sin brought death. And death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. See, Good Friday dealt with the sin problem, but Easter Sunday dealt with the death problem. Death no longer has has reign over you and I. Romans 6 verse 9 and 10 says this, We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives... He lives for the glory of God. There is a a scripture that says death has lost its sting. For a Christian, a physical death has no sting for our. It's actually a doorway into a wonderful future with God. Paul wrote it, Oh death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? There's a young woman who'd been diagnosed with terminal illness and been given three months to live. So she was getting her things in order and she contacted her pastor and the pastor came to her house to discuss certain aspect, aspects of her final wishes. She told him which songs she wanted sung at a funeral, which scriptures that she would like to be read, which outfit she wanted to be buried in. Everything was, in, was put in order and the pastor was preparing to leave when the young woman suddenly remembered something very important. There's one more thing, she said excitedly. What's that? She said, it's very important. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. The pastor stood looking at the young woman, not knowing quite what to say. That surprises you, the young woman said, doesn't it? Well, to be honest, he said, I'm puzzled by the request. The young woman explained, my grandmother once told me this story and from that time on, I've always tried to pass along its message to those I love and those who are in need of encouragement. In all my years of attending social parties and dinner parties, I've always remembered when the dishes of the main course were being cleared, someone would inevitably lean over and say, keep your fork, keep your fork because dessert's coming. Keep your fork because the best is still coming. It was my favorite part because I knew, she said, that there would be a velvet cake, there would be a deep dish apple pie, there would be pavlova, there would be something yummy and I need to keep my fork because the best part of the meal was still to come. So when when people come to my funeral, it will be an open casket. I want them to see me holding a fork and I want them to wonder, why am I holding a fork? And then I want you to tell them at the service, The reason I'm holding my fork is I want people to keep their fork because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. This is the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Although, yes, you might have heard it said like this, that there's only two certainties in life, death and taxes. It is true that unless Jesus returns in your day and my day, we will die. We will physically die die but here's the thing that physical death has been defeated by Jesus so one day the ultimate victory there's going to come a day when you and I are going to be if you're a believer in Christ you will be resurrected from the dead you will get a brand new eternal body death the final victory will be the defeat of a physical death 1 Corinthians says it like this in the same way with the resurrection of the dead our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, 
but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The resurrection of Jesus destroys the eternal power of death. The sting of death has been broken and you and I will be able to live forever with wonderful new spiritual bodies like Jesus. I don't know about you, I wonder what that's going to be like. Good news is when Jesus was raised from the dead, there's a couple of things that are important to me. When Jesus was raised from the dead and he was in his eternal body, they didn't quite recognize him immediately because he looked similar but different. He had some holes in his hands that his disciples touched. But here's, here's some good news for those of you who are foodies. Jesus ate food. Resurrected bodies will be able to eat food. Oh, that just, that's enough right there. That's good news. You'll be able to eat food one day with your resurrected body. The, the third thing that I want to tell us about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is this. It means new spiritual life for those who believe. New spiritual life for those who believe. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this. But God is so rich in mercy and loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, and I'm going to explain that in a moment, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you have been saved. Even though we were dead, what's that mean? He's talking about a condition. Because, and He's talking to people who are obviously alive. So what do you mean we were dead in our, we, we weren't dead, we're, we're not zombies, we're not the walking dead. Said so even though we were, what it's talking about is a spiritual death. Spiritual death happened right at the beginning of time when we were cut off from God. And so when we're born into this uh, world that we live in right now, we are spiritually cut off from God. We're unable to have a relationship with God. And he says, even though you were dead, God gave us life. The resurrection of Jesus means new spiritual life for those of us who believe. 1 Peter verse 1 and 3 says this, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Born again. Because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. I'm not sure if you've been coming to church for a little while, you would have heard the expression, born again. If, you're, if you've maybe seen some things in the media, you, you've heard them talk about, oh, that guy got born again. There was, there was an experience in that person's life. And I want to talk a little bit about what that experience is. We heard Riley talk this morning about her journey. The pain of her, of her life, the, the challenges that she encountered, the things that she turned to to cope with the pain of her life, and then ultimately the surrender of her life to God and the receiving of resurrection life, the receiving of a new life. It's phenomenal to me to, what hap what, to watch what happens when a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ. It's remarkable to me that in a moment, a person's life can, can go from a downward trajectory right. to a different tra trajectory in a moment. Right. Not because they're turning over a new leaf. Not because they've suddenly decided to get some willpower and make some changes. Not because someone's hyped them up with a motivational message and now they can walk across fire and coals because they're so pumped up with a motivational message. That'll be good for a few days, but it'll wear off. Willpower wears off. Uh, motivation wanes, it comes and goes. But what I've seen time and time again is what happens when a person becomes spiritually alive. Dead to God, cut off from God, but in a moment by putting faith in Christ, we become spiritually alive. And in that moment, a transformation happens that nothing else will do. In a moment like that, so many times, and I say this quite often, so many people think Christianity is about taking a bad person and making them a good person. Come to church, we'll dress you up, we'll, we'll give you some new habits, we'll stop you swearing, we'll try and make you kind, we'll, we'll, we'll teach you all these things in your mind, and if you apply all these things and stop doing the bad things and start doing the good things, then you'll be a Christian. Because many people think that's what Christianity is. 
Uh, behavior modification. A change of what I do so that I become a good person. And then, and then many people think this. If I become, if my, eventually my good things outweigh my bad things, then that's my ticket to heaven. I'll be, I'll be made right with God by what I do. And that's a complete misunderstanding of what Christianity is all about. Christianity is not taking a person who's a bad person and making them good. Because if that's the case, then some of you are sitting here thinking, oh, I couldn't be good enough. I, I, I don't have enough time to outweigh all the bad stuff I've done. Yeah. Come on, elbow someone you're sitting next to and say, you know, you know that would be you. Some of you are like, there's no way God could forgive me of what I've done, that the shame that I carry, the mistakes of my past. That's what you think. But then others will think this, well, I'm actually a pretty good person. I don't need God. Uh, they need God. Oh, you should have seen what they've done. They need God. They're so bad, they need to be good, but I'm actually pretty good. Yeah. I'm upright. I'm pretty honest most of the time. I treat people pretty well unless they don't, and then I do. You know, I just, you know. People have it, I'm, so I'm a pretty good person. I believe God's real, so I reckon that makes me right with God. That is a misunderstanding of what Christ came to do. Yeah. He didn't come to take bad people and make us good. That's not Christianity. He, come to he came so that people who are spiritually dead, hello, everybody, spiritually dead and cut off from God. He came to take all of us cut off from God and to bring us alive spiritually, that we would be born again spiritually, that we would be changed. That's why every week in churches just like this and every day in churches just like this and in bedrooms and in coffee shops and in workplaces and in schools and in universities and in homes and neighborhoods all around the world, every day there are people who are praying a prayer and putting their faith in the cross of Jesus and the forgiveness of sin and the resurrection of Jesus, that death's been defeated and I can have a new life. And every day in one moment, people who were dead come to life. It's resurrection life. It's the new life of Jesus. Romans, well, no, that's not the scripture I'm going for. That's okay. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 says this, and I've read it before. I want to read it again. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. This is what happens. And I'm going to get the, uh, at each location, our keys to come on up. So, or our guitar to come on up there in Melbourne. I'm going to get our keys to come on up now. That would be great. This is what happens when a person gets born again. They come alive to God and suddenly God's spirit lives in them on the inside. Suddenly. Suddenly, you're not trying to change. You are changed. Suddenly, instead of being dominated by anxiety, peace comes to, heart, to your heart. Suddenly, instead of having a hopelessness about your future, hope comes to your heart. Suddenly, instead of being a, a person who's absorbed with self and selfishness, then you start to become a more generous person. It's an inward transformation that's not possible with willpower. It's a spiritual birth. I'd love to, I would love to right now just get up thousands of people who just in this church have become born again. Thousands of people who have met Christ and let them just describe the change of what happened. It's a, it's a, one, it's a change that happens in a moment, but then it's a continuous change as God lives in our life and He transforms us. I'd say that there's two things. Overwhelmingly, when I ask people, what, what was it like when you surrendered to God? What was it like? And two things come up time and time again. The first thing is, people say, I just felt an overwhelming sense of peace. I just, I didn't even realize I didn't have peace. But when I, got, when I surrendered to God, I got an overwhelming sense of peace come into my heart. The second thing they'll often say is this, is I just got filled with a love that I knew, that I never knew, didn't know was possible. Just a warmth filled my heart. And that's the love of God. In a moment, we're going to take an opportunity to, to pray. On site, 
here online with Teresa, Melbourne with Dan Frecker, the location pastor. We're gonna have a moment to pray a prayer. And that prayer is a prayer surrendering to God, saying, God, would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of my sin? And would you bring me spiritually alive so that I can be connected to you and that I can know you? I want to, I want to pray for us right now before I hand back. Father, I thank you. Would you just close your eyes wherever you are? I, I thank you for your incredible love. I thank you for what you did through Jesus. And I thank you today that what you're going to do in people's hearts, people who are disconnected from you right now, are going to reconnect, are going to get right with you. A spiritual miracle is about to take place. Hearts coming alive because of you. I pray that you'll speak to every heart away from you and draw them back to to be right with you. And I'm asking it in Jesus' name. Amen.